Feel Good Fathers, welcome. I'm joined by James Christensen. He is a uh, therapist and coach out of Sacramento. He offers his first call free. The links will be down in the doohickey down below. Your children's behavior is a function of how good your marriage is. James, uh, tell us about that. So a family is kind of like an interconnected system and the um, the energy transfers from one person to the other as a form of anxiety. And so what we have is you have, you know, say two parents, let's say you have two parents and two kids, for example. Um, adults are 10 times more capable of managing their emotions, of regulating their emotions than children are. And so if I'm feeling anxiety, let's say I come home from work and I had a bad day and I'm feeling anxious. And let's say we sit down to dinner my anxiety is going to start leaking out into my wife and into the kids. And my wife can probably handle it. She's an adult. You know, she has her emotional regulation skills. And see, my kids are three and five. They're not going to be able to handle that. And so they're going to sense my anxiety and they're going to start acting out just because they don't have any other choice. And so in a child, anxiety turns immediately into behavior and it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be good behavior. It's going to be bad behavior. And so that's kind of led me to the statement I just told you, which is that the quality of my marriage is a huge contribu contribution to, to my children's behavior because a bad marriage is full of way more anxiety than a good marriage is. Got it. All right. Let's handle the positive aspect and the negative aspect first uh, after sure. that. So positive aspect, what are things, we're talking about anxiety. So what are things that uh, dad, father, husband can do to reduce that anxiety before the situation begins? I mean, the first step is just to be aware. And so most of us don't even really know what's happening in our own bodies. And so anxiety is, is more or less a physical thing. So, you know, I live in Sacramento, it's 110 degrees. If I walk outside barefoot in the middle of the day, uh, my body has a safety system. It's going to say, dude, get on the grass or go put shoes on because you're going to like destroy your feet. And so I have this physical, uh, this physical experience that says, protect your body, protect yourself. And that's what pain is for. And we have physical pain that also warns us of relationship problems. And um, so, so like if, if I'm home and my wife gets upset, you know, I'm going to feel, for me, it's going to be like a tightness in my chest. And it's this instantaneous signal that says, wife is upset, watch out. Now, the thing is that, you know, as an adult man, I'm totally safe. You know, I live in California, I'm an adult. I, there's really just no threats in my environment. My, my body still reacts to my wife's emotions as if I was a small child. Um, and if my mom was upset and when I was like two feet tall and my mom was upset, that was a concern, uh, for, for various reasons. But my, my brain is kind of organized around this idea of staying safe as a child, um, with a parent and that parent might be neglectful. That parent might be overbearing. And as a child, you kind of have to deal with that. And so, I don't know, I feel like I just got off track, but I was, I was trying to, trying to get to this idea of being aware of how anxious I am. Yep. I'm trying to deal with that in myself so I don't like kind of dump it down onto my kids. Well, that, I mean, what you were describing was the function of where the behavior comes from. So when we were in, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir. So uh, really it's the, my reaction as, as husband to my wife is going to be a function of the trauma or behaviors that I grew up with with my parents. So in the same thing is true, right? My kids' behaviors are the function of myself and how good my marriage is. So my behaviors are the function of how good my parents' behaviors were. Right. Exactly, so that's yeah. I think I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and from the perspective of self self-awareness, that works, right? Because that's what you're saying is not only be aware of physically what's happening in your body, which is definitely the feel good fatherhood way, right? Your, your emotions are a fuel. They're telling you to do something. And so they're, they're giving you the energy to respond in a specific way. And then, um, that other side of self-awareness is like, do the work on yourself, figure out why you yeah. have patterns of behaviors that you have. I mean, this is, it's completely on point. So, uh, absolutely love it. So we've got, so we have this side of like, okay, so on the positive world, this is how I handle it. I pay attention to what's going on within me. I pay attention to what's happening. Um, with my wife. And so then <clears throat> I think this is interesting because I would, I would say and posit that the base thing that we're taught is to look at your kids and fix your kids, right? That's what we're taught to do. And I'm loving your face here. So let's, let's, let's jump into this piece, your reaction. Yeah. So, you know, in my early days as a therapist, I did a lot of work. I was working for a clinic that served mostly kids. And so parents would just constantly every day, Hey, here's my kid, fix my kid. 
And, and I would just say, you know, what I can do is I can help you be a better parent and that's it. Like, like, you know, I get one hour a week with your kid, you get a hundred and something and you're going to think I'm going to fix your kid in an hour a week. Um, your child is doing the best they can in the situation that you have created for them. Uh, that, I mean, it's a lot of responsibility, but the thing is that parenting is just really, really hard. Um, and you know, my, my role as a parent, and you alluded to this is to protect my child from the burden of the generations that came before me. And so, yeah, I can see your face. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing <laughs> that's is great. I've even heard it talked about as, as can I shield my child from the family curse? And depending on, oh, depending yeah. on what kind of family you grew up in, you know, different families are cursed to different extents, but, but all families are cursed to a certain extent where, you know, your parents experienced things that were wildly inappropriate for them to experience. And then you experienced things that were inappropriate for you to experience. And, you know, my parents shielded me from a huge portion of what they experienced as children but not all. And I yeah. shielded my children from a portion also, but also not all. And that's, that's really the way it is. It, it's, it's a difficult thing to do, but just to be aware of what's happening is, is kind of the key to realize that my default programming is to treat my children the way my parents treated me. And, and if you had amazing parents, first of all, you're probably not listening to this podcast. And, and second of all, you know, good for you, but that's honestly, it's pretty rare to have parents who, you know, really provided that, that perfect container. Um, mm. it's, it's just not a common thing. Parenting is really difficult and we tend to focus a lot of energy on other things other than parenting. And so even if like I'm wildly successful out in the world, the chances that I'm putting as much energy into being a really good parent as I am say in my career are pretty low. Let's I love this. And this is completely what Feel Good Fathered is all about. So you have all this effort you're putting into your, let's say your profession, because that's like the majority of your time. Yeah. Um, and then the other two buckets that you have is like your romance, husband, wife, uh, or husband, spouse um, relationship, and then you have your family. So let's break down. I'd love to say like, what are three things that you can focus on that as a skill development for that marital relationship as that spousal relationship exists like what what are three things that the feel good father could do so the first thing i'm going to come back into this idea of coming into your body so like if i'm asleep and my kids i have teenagers now right so my kids are, my, are older and so you know sometimes at two o'clock in the morning they might still be doing whatever they do well it's summertime you know so they don't wake up till noon anyway so sure. two o'clock in the morning they're playing you know some sort of game in the house or whatever so there's noises if i'm asleep it's interesting because my, my mind is going to incorporate those noises into my dream. And so I'll wake up in the morning and I'm like, I was dreaming about like steam engines last night and construction equipment and whatever it is. And that was because like my teenagers were having a ruckus downstairs. And the thing is that once I awake, once, once I'm awake during the day, my brain still, still does the same thing. And so when my body experiences something when I'm awake, my brain instantly interprets it into a story and says, this is the story about what my body's experiencing. So if I go outside, you know, it's hundred degrees, my feet get hot. My brain says, uh, I feel pain in my feet because the ground is too hot for me. And that's an accurate story. In relationships, the stories we make up are almost never accurate. And so we're living in a dream because my wife gets mad at me and I feel an intense pain in my chest. And, and the story I make up is that this pain in my chest is my wife's fault. And this is because of her. And, and the truer story is that this pain in my chest is slept over from childhood and my wife has very little to do with it. Um, Got and, it. And it's even, it's okay for my wife to be angry sometimes. And the fact that I can't handle that is really more about me than it is about her. Okay. We've just, all right, great. So that's a lot. So the first step is pay attention to what your body's doing. Yeah. And this, is, the, yeah. is the second step like pay attention to the story you're telling yourself about what your body's doing? Well, that you're, it's the same thing. So I like to think of three layers. The top layer is, is story. The middle layer is emotion. And the bottom sure. layer is physical sensation. And, Got it. and every story has an emotion. And every emotion has a physical sensation. And the physical sensation is what is most real. So emotions are mostly made up and stories are even more made up. And so the problem is that we spend all of our time living in story. So I only work with couples. And so every week, you know, I get a few new couples come to my office and they start with a story. He does this, she does this, he doesn't do this. And we have to start at that level. Uh, but I would never let a couple stay there for more than a few minutes because it's all made up. It's not real. 
They, you said what, what's problem is they're experiencing distress in their relationship, mm. and they've made up a story about why they're distressed, and the story isn't true. And we have to get to the truth. I love it. Um, how do you, in real time, because I I firmly believe this. It's like if you if you get to the point where you want to have help, yes, engage a third party, get get some help. I, it, for me, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's your pastor. Uh, probably shouldn't be somebody in your family, but a professional is going to be really, really helpful. Absolutely, yeah. Um, absolutely love that stuff. You said something I thought was really interesting was that your emotions aren't real. I would love to to hear hear your perspective on this. They're, okay, so so my emotions are real in the sense that I would say they're real, but they're not accurate. I have to be careful here. Emotions are very real. I'm an incredibly emotional person. And so when I'm feeling emotions, like I'm definitely feeling that emotion. And so in that sense, it's real. Sure. The problem is that we go so fast to, I feel hurt and it's your fault, right? You hurt me. And it's the, th God, that's it's not, totally, it's yeah, not, yeah. it's not, I mean, you can say maybe the story isn't real. Like when I feel hurt, I do feel hurt. You know, when I go outside and my feet hurt, my feet do hurt. And when my wife is, is angry or withdrawing and I feel hurt, then I do feel hurt. The thing is that, like what's happening is that the human brain is mostly designed for surviving childhood. It's not really designed for creating a thriving marriage. And so mm -hmm. like when I was a kid, you know, I needed my, I needed my, I spent most of my time with my mom. My dad was working most of the time. So it was mostly me and my mom, right? When I was young, I needed my mom to kind of, be with me in a certain way. I need to be loved, protected, um, cared for. I, like kids are incredibly needy. I needed so much from my mom. And when she didn't show up the way that I needed, I would have this pain in my chest that said, your mom is not taking care of you adequately. And that is a survival level problem. And it was. Uh, without my mom to take care of me, I was going to die. And so my entire, like my brain was, organ around, was organized around this idea of make sure mom is caring for you appropriately. That means not too much, not too little. So, you know, she can't abandon you at McDonald's and she can't like be screaming in your face all the time. And so in between is, is the Goldilocks zone where mom is loving you and mom is providing direction and mom is providing discipline and care and protection, but she's not like getting all over you all the time because you're three years old and you can't handle it, you know? So that is great for childhood. That's what my brain is organized around. And now fast forward 20 years later, I, I get married and my brain is still organized around this idea that my wife needs to behave within this very narrow window of not too much, not too little. And every time she steps out of the window, I panic. And I'm like, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. And, and my mind's telling me this is a survival situation. And that's the problem because it isn't anymore. Like as an adult, I'm, I'm going to be fine you know, she, she can neglect me. She can be overwhelming. She can do all these things, but now I'm grown up and, and now I can handle it. But my body's like, no, you can't handle it, dude. You're going to die. And so that's kind of the, the disconnect here. I think the most profound thing you said is that we are, and, and we've, we've heard this, right? Most of the time we just need to be reminded, not, not taught something new that like we're, we're kids, you know, we are, all right. Our, our brain is built as a function to help us survive as a kid, not necessarily to thrive. And I think that's something that when you were saying step one, awareness, I think that's yeah. something to be aware of, to think of, okay, well, what are the patterns of, you know, like I had something very similar recently. Like I had a, I have a very strong reaction to something. And, and we, when I was unpacking it with my wife in the conversation, I was realizing that as a kid, I felt powerless uh, because my, um, because my father was, verbally and emotionally abusive. Yeah. And so I felt powerless. And so then when I'm confronted with a situation where I feel powerless, all that comes up for me again. Yes, you know, and absolutely. it's like, oh, I've been able to put, I've been able to shine the light in the corner of that dark thing. That's like, it's there, the mm -hmm. specter's down. Now I understand it. So now I can go unpack it later on and, and deal with that. So I love it. Okay, so step one, awareness. Step two, what's step two? Um, I'm gonna go with, for step two, I'm going to call it the 80-20 rule, which is that your distress is, your distress is real and 80% of your distress is left over from childhood and 20% is a reaction to what's actually happening right now. Mm. And so first thing is, what am I feeling in my body? I'm feeling distressed and what is the physical component? Oh, for me, it's a pain in my chest. Usually it's, it's throat, chest, or stomach. Like this is where we feel this relationship distress. So where am I feeling it? Um, just can I, can I take a step back and say, 
this is probably not about what it seems like it's about. Mm. Like if I feel 10 out of 10 distress and I'm a 45 year old man and I'm not facing any physical threats of any kind, this is probably a throwback to childhood. So that's the 80, 20. So I just like to think 80% of this is not about what's happening right now. I mean, that means that, you know, if I take this distress to my wife and I say, I'm not okay, I'm not okay, this, 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 and this, you need to fix this and this. What I'm doing is instead of dealing with the 20% that is hers to manage, I'm throwing the whole 100% at her and there's no way she can. I mean, that's, it's just not accurate. It's not helpful. I need to take good care of myself and then approach my wife once I've taken good care of myself. So that might be step, step two. I love that. That's the, this is the idea. Like you, you got to be constantly growing and fixing and, and doing stuff and, and evolving in part. And a big piece of that is coming to the relationship as complete as possible. Yeah. Uh, way back in the day when I was doing like dating coaching and men's confidence and stuff like that, I was telling them, I was like, Hey, look, like you can put all that onus on her, this random person that you're meeting and seeing if you want to have a romantic relationship with them, or you can, you know, build yourself up and come to that moment more complete. And then you'll, you'll, people that are less complete will bounce off you. People that are more complete that have also doing that work, they'll, they'll be a better fit for you. And so th- I, I love this. This is, this is really good. Like deal with your stuff. That's, that's really good. Um, what's number three? Number three, I'm going to, I'm going to go with 50, 50, which is the idea that in a relationship, I'm always going to end up with someone who's operating at my own level of emotional maturity. And the reason for that is that, you know, you see people who marry up in looks, people who marry up in status or wealth, um, even education, whatever it is, what you never, ever see is someone who, who marries up significantly in emotional maturity. Um, and that's whether you're married or not, it's any long-term committed relationship is going to exist between two people operating at the same level of emotional maturity. The reason is that like, if I'm out dating and I go on a first date or a second date and uh, the woman I'm dating is like significantly less mature than I am, I'm going to get so turned off immediately. And and to a much greater extent than physical looks or wealth or anything else, the, the emotional maturity is so hardwired into our brains that we will never partner up with someone who's significantly less mature than we are. This is and, fascinating. And Leonardo DiCaprio needs to really take a hard look at that because of, you know, what <laughs> I mean, think about what's happening. Like if he's happy dating a 27-year-old, you know, that says something about him. So um, the, the 50-50 rule says, it's really easy for me to look across at my partner and say, wow, you're so immature and you are right. And you have an equivalent immaturity on your side. It's not, it's not the same immaturity, but it's equivalent. And that's gold mm-hmm. because if I can look at my wife and say, my goodness, you're not showing up in a very mature way, that means that I'm showing up at a similar level in the relationship and I just can't see it. And that's when you go and you reach out to someone and you say, help me see what I can't see. Because all of my power is for me to change my contribution to the relationship. And and my instinct is to change hers, (laughs) which of course doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, yeah, that's what, that's our default today. The default is to change somebody else, not to, not to change ourselves. Yeah, of course. I love this. So applying these things, right? It's all in the idea that by improving ourselves, by improving our marital relationship, that our relationship with our kids is going to get better. So, you know, these are, these are kind of the positive sides. So I think now kind of in the negative area would love to kind of understand like what, like, what are some more warning signs to take a look at? What are some more behaviors that maybe lean more towards like how men act out or how men manifest uh, some of these more negative behaviors? So in case a feel good father or listener has some of these, they can work on themselves and grow. One common uh, kind of pattern that I see is, is a man showing up in a childish way. And so a lot of relig- a lot of relationships have kind of a, a parent child dynamic where one partner tends more towards childish behavior and the other one tends more towards parental behavior, but towards their partner. Um, and so you can call it one up, one down. I, I sometimes call it a teeter totter because the further one person goes up, it pushes the other person down. So the stereotypical, you know, example is a, you know, an alcoholic, uh, husband and a codependent wife. And so she's like, so all high and mighty. I don't drink. You do drink. I'm good. You're bad. And, and they're both kind of contributing to the other's behavior. And it kind of works for both of them in a sick way where she, I mean, what's happening is that the person who's looking down on the other person is dealing with a sense of insufficiency. 
So if I'm looking down on you, it's because I don't feel good about me. And, and my instinctive solution is to say, well, at least I'm better than you. And, and the, this, this goes to some really interesting places where if I'm getting my sense of self from looking down on my wife, then I actually need my wife to show up in an immature way. And, and I'm going to start subconsciously contributing and encouraging my wife's childish behavior because it makes me feel better about me. Um, and I've, I've seen this a hundred times. Um, now, on the other hand, the person who's getting looked down on has learned to create a sense of self from being looked down on. And so they need to be condescended to, and they're going to, at the same time, do these things and make it really easy for their partner to look down on them because that's how they've gotten used to thinking of themselves as, I'm the victim of a person who looks down on me. And that's what makes it okay for me to be me. So we're falling into the, be we're creating the, rela the, the behaviors and the relationships that we've dealt with in the past. Yeah, it comes back to this idea that your brain was designed to survive childhood. Um, kind of the way the brain develops is, you know, most of your brain does develop in childhood and it, it's mostly focused on managing that child-parent relationship because that's how you survive as a kid. Um, and depending on, you know, how mature your parents were, that, that, program is, that programming is either kind of soft or hard. And if you had a very difficult childhood with, you know, difficult parents, your brain is programmed um, in a way that's quite difficult to even notice. And um, it's hard to change. It's not impossible. I mean, this is what I do professionally, but depending on how difficult your parents were to deal with and how much they really cared about you, it can be really hard to, to reprogram this. But the first step is just to be able to see it, to say, um, because we, we all just live in this fantasy, you know, that the other person is the one who's the problem. Um, and, and it's just not true. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay. Cool. Good, good, heavy stuff. You know, listen to yeah. this again. It's, yeah. it's, it's awesome. Uh, what about like, let's, let's lean into some more, um, fun stuff, right? So how would you increase passion and intimacy, not sexual, just passion and mm. intimacy? Uh, how would you suggest a couple do that? Um, wow, this is, this is a tough question. So I think you kind of have to start by taking a really hard look at how do you really feel about your partner? And so one, one of the things we, we, the trap we end up in here is just that I know you're trying to get more fun. <laughs> Let's see. That's all good. It's all good. Either way. I mean, to increase passion and intimacy, I guess one thing that gets in the way of intimacy is that, well, let me define intimacy as intimacy is when I allow you to see who I really am. That's what intimacy is. And so sure. if I reveal my mind to you, I just unilaterally created intimacy, but only if I reveal my mind to you and I don't need you to tell me that it's okay. So it's called a uh, self-validated self-disclosure. So I'm going to let you see inside me, right? Um, you know, we think about intimacy as taking off your physical clothes, but I'm going to take off my psychological clothes and let you right. see into my mind. And if you don't like it, I'm still going to be okay. And I'm not going to try to make you like it. That's the key. And so yeah. Oftentimes, if I'm feeling disconnected in my relationship, it's because I'm actually running a deception campaign where I'm trying to make you think that I think or feel one thing when I actually don't think or feel that thing. Uh, Love so it. The, okay, the way let's... to create intimacy is to bring down that guard and, and just allow the person to see you as you truly are and to be okay if they're not happy about what they see. So I think... Right. There's a, there's a super big challenge here, right. In yes. being able to, to create this space because this is a self, a self side. So what I'd, I'd like to do is introduce, how do you create a space for somebody else to do this? And I think we can kind of discover how you do it yourself in that world. Mm -hmm. Cause like, I think that there's the leading from the front, which absolutely kind of do this. And then when you put yourself out there, most of us in high school or middle school, if your experience is anything like mine, you learn that that's not a safe environment. Right? Oh yeah, sure. Because of that kind of stuff. So you're doing that and you're bringing that habit here. But how do we create, if our partner is doing this, how do we create the space for them? What, what are things to look out for? 
One of my favorite phrases um, taught to me by a coach a long time ago is that I need you. Wait, what, what was it? <laughs> I need you to change for me to be okay. And that's kind of uh, what you're touching on here is that if I want to allow my partner to open up to me, if I want to make that um, easier, sure. um, I need to take a hard look at can I be okay when my partner shows up authentically? Or am I pressuring right. my partner to show up in an inauthentic way? Mm. Okay. Okay. And so so what I need to look at is when you show me who you really are, how much distress do I experience? And am I blaming that distress on you or am I taking responsibility for my own distress? Which is of course the solution. Sure. So part of creating Okay, great. So part of this is that self-awareness again, where it's like, am I having a physical reaction? Why am I having a physical, rea physical reaction to what's yeah. going on? Yeah, that's, and there's another part of it, which is, you know, these deep, deep human instincts. If you think about, I mean, think about our first six months on the planet. The only way, the only tool we have to get taken care of is emotional distress. So if I need my diaper changed, I need to use emotional distress. I need to cry right? If I need food, I need to cry. If I need a hug, I need to cry. That is the only tool I have. And so deeply, deeply programmed into my brain is when I don't get what I want, it's time to have emotional distress. Um, that is perfect for us as babies. And it's really, really bad for us as adults. It, it doesn't work. It creates the opposite reaction. It creates all sorts of misery. And just the idea that my brain is programmed to experience emotional distress when I don't get what I want because I used to be a baby is a pretty important reality. Gives kind of new meaning to the whole hero's journey, going out and slaying the dragon thing, right? In what way? If if the dragon, we uh, we contextualize the dragon as an exterior force. I have to go out into the world, learn a lesson, conquer mm -hmm. something, defeat mm -hmm. an evil, however you want to describe right, right, the dragon. Right. Uh, and then I take that lesson and I come back and then I apply it and I learn it. And what we're describing here in this context is that the dragon is actually you. And it's, yeah. um, and even, and it's not even because I, I don't even know if I want to go so far as to say that the dragon is your baby. You, I think the dragon hmm. is that behavior, that automatic response yeah. to something that's okay. Like it's totally okay if a baby's crying. It is totally okay that you were oh, crying yeah. as a baby sure. to get what you want. Of course. And, but really that dragon is just the, as you're saying, that lack of emotional maturity as you're growing up. So I think that that, <laughs> that context is interesting. Remind me, remember the movie, How to Train Your Dragon? Remember yeah, how yeah. he actually ended up, he, he learned to deal with the dragons with kindness and that's the solution. And so, so if, if the dragon is the patterns your brain learned to survive childhood and then the solution is kindness. Um, and, uh. and this is critical because our instinctive solution is to try to slay the dragon. So when I feel distress, I'm going to get mad at myself for feeling distress and, yeah. and then I'm going to feel more distress. And then the cycle goes on. So we all have this internal critic that says, oh, you're yeah. so soft. You're what you, you know, the, you know, that your, your own voice in your head. The solution is if I feel distress, um, can I offer to myself the same kind of warmth and kindness that I would offer to a small child? Love um, it. And, and when I feel that internal critic pipe up and say, you're an idiot, you're no good, can I offer to that internal critic, to the part of me that's critical, the same kindness that I would offer to a small child? Um, that really is a solution and, and that energy of kindness and love induces neuroplasticity in the brain and helps the brain start to rewire itself. Okay, love this. I, I think many of us have heard these things. I always wanna to default to the practical. Yes. How, how do I do this? And even, even then we can yeah. even go into like, what can I do? Cause fighting the, I mean, not fighting, but can, uh, addressing that internal critic that's automatic that's consistently there and this is an like it's an entire mindfulness thing right it's yeah. like all meditation all that kind of stuff so what's a practicum that we can do here to mm -hmm. begin this journey or if we already do it well it even further go even further into into a, a positive version of this internal mm -hmm. kindness so i'm going to give you three steps um 
N-A-L, notice, allow, and love. And so the first step is to notice. And so if your internal critic is speaking up, can you become aware? Oh, hi, I hear you. But, yeah, got but it. just that step is so powerful because you are separating yourself from the internal critic. If you can hear the critic, that means that someone is listening. Now, the problem is that usually we're just fused. So the internal critic is us and there is no second, there's no second uh, observer inside. So I hear you. I allow means, so that's the first step is to notice. So notice means I'm going to become aware that something's happening. Okay. The second is allow. It's okay that this is happening. And this is critical because whatever is happening inside my head is happening for a reason. Uh, I, I became who I am. Honestly, my life experiences have led me to this place and my development, my developmental journey is not to push against what's happening, but to go into and through the fire. And that means I have to accept the reality of what's happening to me first so that I can grow out of it. But if I push away from it, I'm going to back away from that fire. I'm never going to get through to the other side. So notice, allow. The third step is love. <laughs> I mean, it sounds corny, but love is always a solution. And the solution is love because love induces neuroplasticity and my brain will never change to the extent that that it's not experiencing love and kindness. And as an adult, that love and kindness mostly has to come from within. It can help, you know, like you, in my office, I'm, I'm helping, I'm helping with that energy, right? Sure. Um, hopefully your wife is helping with that energy, but another person is never going to be, you know, more than half of the solution. It's mostly going to be, can I learn to love the part of me that I hate the most? That's the solution. Okay. Uh, I keep thinking mainly, mainly cause I'm watching, watching a little bit of like house of dragon and we were talking about how to train your dragon. And I was thinking about a dog cause I've, you know, I've seen well-adjusted, nurtured, cared for dogs and they have a certain reaction and way of being. And then I've also been around clearly abused dogs. Yeah, of course. And I think of when, you know, when I put my hand down to introduce myself to the dog, right? So let's, let's unpack this and then I'll bring it to the dragon thing later. But, uh, I put my, you don't, when you're meeting a new dog, you don't immediately go for the pet. Like you don't do that because the dog has to get to know you. And like it, I, the way that I think about it is that like, if you're out in, in a social environment and a random person that you don't see comes and touches you, you're going to kind of like have a, you might turn, like if you're more adjusted, you might turn and be like, for those of you listening, I'm turning and kind of pantomiming, like who touched me, you know, but if you're anxious or something else is going on, you might have like a jump, jump start reaction. Um, uh, but with a dog, you put your hand down, you let the dog sniff you. And then if they're okay with it, you might go and give them a pet. Like you usually don't want a pet on top of the head. You want a pet like either on the neck, usually the back of the neck or on the body. There's, there's, there's like good, good spots where you can do it, but an adjusted dog will lean into, will, will kind of like say, Oh, I, you're safe. You're okay. I'm going to kind of come alongside you. The dog will kind of, usually they'll kind of walk in front of you or they'll walk by your leg and just say, you can pet me yeah, of course. a, uh, a poorly adjusted dog or something, a dog that's been abused in some way will typically immediately go into hackles or will shirk away from what's going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've, I've introduced, I've, I've been introduced to one of these dogs and, um, it was like the moment my hand went to go touch like the neck or the back, just like the dog in a, in a split second move, like three feet away. And I was like, Oh, okay, cool. And then I just like, I just kind of turned the owner and I was like, I don't think your dog wants to say hi to me. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah. like, Hey, and yeah. it's okay. Not your fault. Not the dog's fault. Just, I don't think your dog likes me and that's totally fine. And, uh, so when I think of whenever we're kind of confronted in a fantasy environment, like I was thinking specifically of, um, how to train your dragon, there's a moment where the animal will lean in its maw, its face. And that's when you always see the hand touching like the nose or the, or the face, like you think of like a horse or you think of a dragon, or you think of these moments, like there's a moment where the person there, the animal says, yes, okay. And then, and does the petting and I, and I can't help but think, all right, so we got this NAL pattern, right? Notice, um, Accept acknowledge love. love that that love step is like, okay, if we treat that internal voice as this dragon, like 
it's going to lean in and then you can kind of give it a pet. I know it's, it's kind of a weird analogy, but no, that's, this that's is a what great I was analogy. And, and we have to have analogies because what we're actually dealing with is neurons in the brain and it doesn't do us any, like, I can't program my brain directly. You know, I can't program my brain the way I program a computer. I can't reach those neurons. We have to reach the neurons through stories. And so Love it. one story or one image to think of is that a healthy brain has, is two things. It's balanced and it's connected. And an unhealthy brain is unbalanced and unconnected. And what we're doing is imagine the brain developing, I'm, I'm talking with my hands here, but the brain developing in layers. And so, you know, your core layer develops like before the age of five, and then you get a little bit added on as you grow. That core layer never goes away. It's still there. And the wiring is still there. And it was designed to handle your situation in life when you were five years old. And if you had very kind, loving parents and that core layer uh, is much better suited to handling adulthood than if you had harsh parents. But you have what you have. You don't get to pick your parents. Um, what can happen though is the solution here is for the layers to develop more connections between them. And that's when I said that that's what that love does. And so when that harsh voice speaks up in your head, if you can reach out and love, you are literally building neurons in your brain at that moment. And every time you can offer love and support and kindness and just generosity and grace, to these mm. parts of you that are kind of ugly and kind of childish, then the, the grown up part of your brain, which is the part that's capable of love is connecting with the child part of your brain. And you're going to be okay as long as those two parts are talking to you. And, and when we are regressed, when we're not mature, what's happening is the child part of the brain is taking over and it's completely let go of the adult part of the brain. And, and you see, I mean, we see this all the time. You see adults acting like children they're literally being controlled by the child parts of that brain. The adult part of the brain has just turned off. They do brain scans where they can show this via blood flow, you know, where the more advanced part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, it, it mostly develops later in life. And, and when we get hyper, um, when we get hyper defensive or aroused or scared, the blood flow literally shifts to the other parts of the brain and those parts of the brains, they turn off. Um, so the interconnectedness of the brain is the solution to, I would say, most of our problems. And that's kind of like the work we're doing, but we have to use stories to get there. I love it. Uh, this is such, um, you know, I, I like in my head, like all these different things are going on, you know, uh, analogies to the, these concepts. Uh, Tony Robbins says, you can't feel fear if you're feeling grateful. Like gratitude is a form true. of love, right? So, and the reverse like, is okay. also true, right? Where where you can't feel grateful if you're feeling fear, um, right? And so, the solution to a lot of this is kindness and courage. I mean, just because you brought up fear, as a child, I didn't really have access to courage. Children are not really capable. There's a reason. I mean. We don't expect children to be courageous for good reason because they're not capable of it. Okay. So, right. so as a child, if I was facing fear, my real only solution, if I had to act in the face of fear was to get angry because anger is, is the motivating, the empowering stance of saying, I am so scared. I'm going to do it anyway. Rawr, right. And that's what mm. we do now as an adult, I have a third option, which is I can stay calm. I can stay kind and loving, and I can face my fear with courage. And this is an adult capacity, but my programming is still very much, I'm a kid. Well, it's not that I'm a kid. It's just that the only way I know, and for most of us, the only way that was ever demonstrated what, for us was either to accommodate in fear or to take action in anger. And we never saw the third way, which is to take direct, uh, strong action with nothing but love and kindness. And that's the solution. James, I think you've... Uh, you've definitely blown my mind. I've had oh, a really you. good conversation. Any uh, any closing thoughts uh, as we're wrapping? Um, I guess my closing thought is that the biggest challenge most of us face in life is building a strong marriage. Definitely true for me. Um, and, and also the most important challenge we face in life. Uh, parenting is a close second in both of those categories. The thing is that Parenting is very much a function of how strong your marriage is. And so when I work with couples, I'm like, as your marriage improves, as your marriage heals, a lot of these things you're worried about are just going to take care of themselves because a lot of them are just byproducts of the distress in your marriage. So 
if I want my children to be more mature and more responsible and more disciplined and more kind, talking to them about that is, is a waste of time. Becoming that in my marriage and allowing them to see me do that in my marriage is a solution. And specifically come back to this courage idea that my kids need to see me take direct action in the face of fear without getting angry. And the place they're going to see that it is how I handle myself in my marriage. Mind blown. Uh, James. <laughs> Thanks, James. James Christensen, everybody. All right.